How can we read the Bible to hear God's voice? Because it is his word and he wants to communicate with us. An amazing fact of the scriptures is that God is addressing everyone with them. And it's not the same that you hear each time you read it. God speaks to different ages so that there are some words which are locked, as it were, until the end of time, and then their meaning will be revealed. And in your own life, as you read them again and again, you constantly discover new meanings. There's no other book like this. Now, because it is rather large, especially the Old Testament can put people off, and it seems obscure in many places. But think of the DNA of the body. The scriptures are like the DNA for the body of Christ, the church. And in a cell of your body, when something is needed, the cell has a way to pass through the whole DNA again and again and take that part which is needed. And so one can dip into the scriptures at random, just open it up and think that it's speaking, especially to the moment. But this is a little bit dangerous. The risk is that you read too much into what you find, forcing a meaning onto it. What is more reliable is to read through the whole scriptures again and again and again. It might take a year each time or perhaps more, but it's worth this investment because all the parts of the Bible are connected to all others. Then you might find the link that God wants to speak to you to link with other parts. So the more we're familiar with all the stories, it's when we see how they connect together that new truths emerge. And so, we can find the passion of Christ throughout the whole of the Old Testament or Our Lady's victory over the Antichrist or the meaning of Holy Mass. It's on every single page and also the conversion of the Jews at the end of history. There's no way actually to understand the scriptures without going to the church fathers, listening to them. They were so immersed in it, given graces by God to understand and interpret and teach. And so this new old series relies heavily on the church fathers. Thanks be to God, it seems to be working. Here are two or three reviews, which I will not read out. But if you pause the video, you can see they are leading people into the Old Testament so that they want to read further themselves. And this for me is success. Because again, the scriptures speak to each person, not just individually, but also at the right times in their life. If they're willing to make that work, to read and read, which means to listen to God. And it takes time to familiarize ourselves with his voice. And because not everyone is a big reader, some have asked me to make this series into audiobooks, and now the first three of those are available. It's a little bit expensive to produce them, but if you were thinking of signing up to Audible, then there are some bounty URL links in the description below. Whereas if you purchase or sign up to Audible through this link, then a bonus payment is made to New Old Publishing, and that's very helpful. But only use those links if you're thinking of signing up to Audible instead of buying a one-off book. To give a taste of how all this works, there follows now the audio from the introduction to If You Believe Moses, and I will put up the text as well on the screen. Some people find the audio more immersive than the text. It's as if you're there with these Old Testament characters. And the fact is they are here with us, though in heaven, they're watching over us all. It's very, very real. If you're wondering what's happening in the world now or what's happening in the church, God's telling us through the scriptures. If we know how to read them, we'll hear his voice and we'll have peace even in this storm. If you believe Moses, volume one, the conversion of the Jews promised in the Old Testament. Introduction Quote from Acts 9 And as he went on his journey, it came to pass that he drew nigh to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shined round about him, and falling on the ground he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who said, Who art thou, Lord? And he, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Close quote. The conversion of the Jews before the great and dreadful day of the Lord is as desirable as it is inevitable. It will happen, and it will be awesome. That the final conversion of the Jews will certainly happen is solidly attested by scripture and tradition. 
With it will come the perfect completion of human history. This book and its subsequent volume are not written to persuade Jews to convert to Christianity. Rather, they aim to persuade Christians that the outcome is foreordained by God and that we must pray properly for it. If we do, then in God's time the conversion will happen, followed soon after by the awesome return of our Lord Jesus Christ on clouds of glory. If we postpone praying for the conversion of the Jews, then we will taste hell on earth until we do. Accordingly, this first volume, if you believe Moses, the conversion of the Jews promised in the Old Testament, seeks to show that the conversion to Jesus Christ of the Jewish people en masse is foretold throughout the Scriptures. It is told from the beginning to the end of the Old Testament, although this can only be perceived in the light of Christ, which shines forth from the New Testament. We should be aware that the two Testaments, Old and New, rather than being mere books, are two ways of living, their essence captured within religious rites. The old was carried out with the blood of animals. The new is in the blood of Christ. Reassuringly, besides being in the Bible, the conversion of the Jews is encapsulated in very visible rituals of every single traditional mass, not in the Novus Ordo. Mindful that the scriptures alone cannot suffice, a second volume, if you believed Moses, the conversion of the Jews as the close of history, shows that the same truths found in the scriptures are also contained by tradition, notably in the church's venerable liturgy. Concerned with spiritual action, this second book examines methods of prayer that cannot fail. Unless the passage of time and the depths of our differences foster doubt that the Jews will ever convert, that volume inquires, why has God allowed this delay? It ventures five complementary reasons, all of them beneficial. Next, it considers the sweep of history from the crucifixion to the present, providing deep data for what is cautiously called the Jewish question. A theological lens allows a useful assessment of very vexed matters, such as the relation of the new covenant to the old, and the links between false messianism, Zionism, and world domination, all of which culminate in the Antichrist, who will be Jewish. Finally, it asks, what can Catholics do? Proposing a threefold resolution which begins in the soul. Understand, pray, love. To these ends, this current volume is written to deepen our faith and awaken our hope. The subsequent volume is written to inflame our charity, and when this is done, to face the gravity of the depravity that threatens us. At the deepest level, it is a matter of how men react, today, to the crucifixion. This movement of the human will, at the innermost level of the soul, is what works the greatest leverage over the whole world. By our own choice, each of us puts that lever in the hands of God or Satan. After the Jews convert, it will be over for Satan. He will be cast into the pool of fire and brimstone for ever and ever. To postpone the day, he does all he can to antagonize Catholics and Jews. He sends demons to sow malice, uses the mighty to falsify history, and urges an hysterical outcry if truth be attempted in the public square. But there are two perennial and God-given witnesses which Satan cannot silence, Scripture and tradition. It is precisely because these sources of divine revelation are so salutary that the enemy frantically works to obscure them. His progress can be observed in the evisceration of exegesis and the catastrophic liturgical changes of past decades. Catholic exegesis 
is seemingly crippled by Judaism's false axiom that it is illicit to draw any more meaning from the scriptures than the human author intended. But confining the Old Testament to the literal sense and academic inquiry to the historical critical method denies readers the infinite goods of the multiple spiritual senses which God has laid into the literal. As at fertilization, he sends an immortal soul into an ovum. In close parallel, the radical changes to Catholic liturgy since the 1950s have been deliberately engineered to accommodate the spirit of this world, which is the fatal fault of Judaism, overestimating man while underestimating God. Thankfully, the liturgy cannot be taken down, even were the Bishop of Rome to try. The desire in human hearts to reciprocate God's ineffable love is a force stronger than anything our enemies can muster. Whatever damage they do, they cannot stop the faithful from seeking optimum worship of God. The restoration of the traditional and apostolic liturgy is unstoppable. Similarly, the scriptures are the safest written record in existence. Having spread their testimony for millennia, having been corroborated by countless authors through the centuries, they are now available to everyone online in scanned images of the earliest extant manuscripts. They cannot be falsified in the way so much else of history can. The witness of Scripture is secure for those who seek it out. Scripture and tradition cooperate to offer joint witness to the same truth. As the Catholic liturgy is wed to the Word of God, then we can apprehend ancient interpretations of the Bible through their placement in the liturgy. Hence, Dom Prosper Granger comments on Jeremiah, quote, this passage of Jeremiah 23 is equally applicable to the conversion of the Jews and the restoration of Israel, which are to take place at the end of the world. This was the view taken by the chief liturgists of the Middle Ages in order to explain thoroughly the Mass of the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. Close quote. Scrutiny of this fascinating point is reserved to Volume 2, which deals more directly with the witness of the liturgy. For now, we note that the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost is the penultimate in the church year, coming just before the theme of the Last Judgment and Jesus' Advent. The placing of this Mass in the calendar speaks of the church's expectation that the Jews will convert just before the end. Confidence in this coming conversion is as old as the Church. It is taught by the greatest theologian, St. Paul. In his dramatic election, Saul saw the light of Christ on the way to Damascus, a vessel chosen by God, not in spite of, but because of his past as a ferocious persecutor of the Church. He was a man in Christ, caught up into the third heaven, into paradise, and heard secret words which it is not granted to man to utter. He converted, knowing his subject inside out, having been the problem and seen the solution, after much suffering he wrote to the Romans that the conversion of all Israel was sure. This same teaching is the consensus of the fathers. It appears in the most lauded work of Origen, is upheld by the greatest patristic theologian, St. Augustine, as also by the greatest exegete, St. Jerome, the holy and erudite Pope St. Gregory the Great, as well as by England's greatest biblicist, the Venerable Bede. The doctrine is extensively treated by the greatest of schoolmen, St. Thomas Aquinas, Referenced by the most assiduous commentator of the Counter Reformation, Cornelius Alapide, annotated in the famous Dawe Reims edition translated by Bishop Richard Chaloner, and asserted magisterially 
by Pope Pius IX. Representing just a fraction of suitable sources spanning the life of the Church, each of these saintly scholars is quoted in the course of this book. Whence did this stupendous cloud of witnesses learn of the final conversion of the Jews? Here we pause to consider God's method. His revelation cannot be forced. St. Paul taught on the matter only after, by the aforementioned act of God's will, he received the light of Christ Jesus reigning in heaven, who took up Saul and gave us Paul. The Apostle, now with the gift of faith, expounded on the Jews' conversion through examples from nature, from the Old Testament scriptures, and from theological insight into God drawing good from evil. At our own level, we may perceive the same light, if weaker, through contemplation of the parables of Jesus, the works of Jesus, and the earthly life of Jesus, from his nativity to his ascension. It is from him that the apostles received the teaching. We must believe to understand, fides querens intellectum. Yet we may easily believe it, because so many saints of the Church have taught it. Jesus, through the Gospels, offers us a key to unlock the Old Testament. Then St. Paul, in his canonical letters, begins to unlock it. The key is the relationship between younger and elder brothers. This is a major theme throughout the Torah, the five books of Moses. Have you ever wondered why the first book of the Bible is so dominated by families and the crises that erupt within them? Genesis is all about Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and his family, Abraham and his, through to the tensions between Jacob's twelve sons. Then it ends with divine blessings upon them. There is a special meaning to this which is vital to salvation. The New Testament decodes the Torah to reveal the sublime promise of the final conversion of the elder brother, the Jews, to Christianity. Therefore, after learning from Jesus in the first section below, that is, the conversion of the Jews in the light of Christ, we proceed to the conversion of the Jews promised in the Torah. This follows the lives of seven sets of brothers, gaining hope from the narrative which emerges from the whole series. The next section looks elsewhere and finds the same truth, namely, the conversion of the Jews foretold in the prophets, writings and historical books. Some of these cases depend upon reading a double fulfillment of the prophecies, one near and one far. Others turn on an enigmatic phrase. Others run through the biographies of biblical protagonists, such as David and Saul, living icons of the New Testament and Old. Another is simply staggering, discovering the whole doctrine laid deep into the book of Tobit is like having scales fall from one's eyes. Once seen, it cannot be unseen. In fine, the final conversion of the Jews is concealed throughout the Old Testament, waiting to be illumined by the light of Christ. For the final section of this volume, saving the best until last, we turn to Our Lady. A handful of verses in the book of Exodus recount the actions of a woman renowned for her beauty. The key pericope is just three verses long, and it is notoriously difficult to understand. Exodus 4, verses 24 to 26. I believe it speaks of the Blessed Virgin Mary, how she fulfills the Old Covenant and gives birth to the New. A couple of follow-up verses later in Exodus allude to the Jewish people entering the company of the Church at Holy Mass before the Day of Judgment. This we explore in the last section, One Woman Bridges the Covenants. Mary 
is pivotal. It is through Mary that the light of Jesus Christ came into the world.